the standard projector. So that's one way of, of kind of working around that. And then the other feature to look at on the projectors does it have projector controls uh, built into it. And what those controls will allow you to do possibly is to turn on and off the projector through FPP. And I guess I should uh, should have said in the beginning here, I'm, I'm making the assumption that if you're watching this, uh, that you may have some familiarity, some familiarity with FPP and X lights. Uh, if not, uh, this obviously I'm not gonna walk through all the features of FPP, but uh, there's obviously a lot of great resources on that. But one of the great things in FPP is it does have the scripts uh, for you to do projector controls. And when you look at the FP plugin for projector controls, there are a list of projectors that are already have those scripts built into them into FPP. And so that's one way you can kind of, if you're a new person seeing, well, this projector work with what I'm attempting to do. And so that's really what I did with, with this Optima. I looked down the list and saw that it was on there and knew that that would work. Now those projector controls are nice. They're not necessary. You could still turn a projector on manually on and off, but uh, it is a nice feature to have. On the back of the projector, if you're using these projector controls, it comes in a different, a uh, couple different ways to, to control those. Uh, one of them is through this RS-232 or this DB9 um, serial connection. Now, they look similar to a VGA, but they are not the same thing. So don't get RS-232 and a VGA uh, pinout uh, confused. So those RS-232 uh, would require a uh, an adapter cable, which uh, I attached an image of the one that I have, uh, and that connects uh, your Pi to the actual projector. And that is how uh, you're, it's allowing you to turn on and off the, your projector. The other piece that you may need is this null modem adapter. It is different from a gender changer. So on my projector, uh, I had a male end of the uh, cable here, of the DB9 cable, and a male end on the projector. So you needed a uh, adapter for the two female ends. Uh, the first mistake I bought was just a gender changing adapter. So it was female, female, and that did not work, but the null modem adapter does. So make sure you're selecting the right one. There are other ways to control your projector, PGA link, uh, which uses uh, basically like an ethernet uh, connection and there's USB controls and some others. Again, I, I'm this is very new to me as well. So I'm not as familiar with those. There are some great people out there. I know Pat Delaney's a, a great resource. I reached out to him last year when I was having some issues and there's plenty of others that could probably help you either in the Zoom room or through uh, Facebook connections. So as far as the video player itself, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, you'll need a, a Pi, uh, I think the 3B or, or Pi 4B uh, should work. I used the Pi 4B, uh, the two megabit, uh, version was is, had plenty and it works just fine. Uh, one of the big differences between the two is the Pi 3 has a full size HDMI output. So if you're going to use the Pi 4, you're going to need a micro HDMI video output. Now there are two micro HDMI outputs on the Pi 4. I got them circled here, but you're going to want to use the one that's nearest the power port or power port. So HDMI 0, that's the one that you should be using. Um, I've heard that people have had issues if they tried using HDMI one. So make sure you're using the correct one. If for some reason it's still not working, try the other one, but it should work. So your projection surface, um, you can project on your house, uh, your garage door. Uh, my garage sits on the side of my house. If I had a garage in the front side, I would probably use that as the projection surface. Uh, the nice thing about projecting on your home or the garage, uh, there's really minimal setup required. You don't have pull uh, put up a screen uh, one of the downsides could be that your surface could be really too dark uh, or it could have too much ambient light again as if you have a street light across the street like i do uh, if it's depending on the surface too shiny it could produce a glare or reflection um, and it does require a front projection unless you're inside so uh, i think i showed that picture of rick's house earlier he uses rear projection from inside his garage if you are doing the front projection, of course, you have to consider the exposure to weather as well as potentials for theft. Uh, the other option, obviously, is you can use a screen. Um, this is the screen I used. I think it went up in price since I first bought it. Uh, it is a 
spandex screen, so it stretches really well. It 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 doesn't have wrinkles. Uh, it's quick to set up, quick to take down. Uh, but that's also one of the downsides to it. Uh, I remember during Christmas, I'd have to race home from work to get home in time to get my screen set up, to get the projectors set up, so that my, when my show kicked on, it was ready to go. Uh, rear projection is possible with this type uh, then, and that's initially what I did. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of that, but uh, one of the cons is uh, the, the glare from, from the video uh, behind it. Um, and also, there can be some wind and weather issues, which I'll show you here in a second. So at Halloween, this is just a quick uh, video that I use to play in between my sequences. Um, and you can see uh, the glare that it's producing behind. I've got this set up on my porch. And from up close, it doesn't seem so bad. But from a distance, that glare really glows back from behind your, your screen. And if I show you a little bit different view of it there you can see it uh again at uh christmas that that glow uh, shining from behind there one of the downsides to this is it it uh, makes the video recording or taking pictures uh kind of hard to turn out very good so and you can also see in this image the the street light across the street really kind of lights up the front of my house now this was set up as rear projection if the next picture i'll show you here is front projection because Right after Christmas, uh, two things happened. My uh, street light across the street went out, which was a blessing. But then we also started really getting a lot of wind. And what you'll notice is even on this image, the wind can play havoc on that screen in your image. And it will shrink and grow. And it, it really made it difficult for viewers to be able to see your video. So this is uh, shortly after Christmas, I was able to... Uh, do front projection and you notice obviously without the street light there, it, the image is much better. You don't see the glare or the glow coming from the projector. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the enclosure. Uh, you can go out and find some professional manufactured outdoor rated enclosures. Um, the ones I saw were very expensive, probably not uh, very helpful for our hobby. Uh, you can use a number of other things. There, obviously, there's some images here of a plastic tote. I've heard of people using coolers. Uh, you can build one out of wood boxes. Uh, one of uh, one of our people here in our groups uses the MTM crate, which I think is a great idea. If I had uh, seen this before I made mine, I, I probably would have gone this route. Uh, Pelican style case. And then one idea that I had initially considered was a networking cabinet like you see down here. So the networking cabinet uh, can, uh, it's got that glass in it already. Obviously the, you would have to still make it a little bit more weather resistant with all the ventilation holes. Uh, one of the tips that, that you might want to look at are some of the home theater forums because they have, uh, people that talk about projector enclosures, hush boxes, uh, to give you an idea of, of what your build will need. You could also build your projector enclosure into some props. Uh, I know I've seen lots of pictures of people using tombstones, pillars, uh, interesting stump here or crates. Uh, you have to think about your weather weatherproofing or the ceiling of the uh, of the enclosure. Uh, it's going to require a lot of ventilation, uh, way more ventilation than even I anticipated. And especially if you're in a warm climate, uh, it's going to require more than than those of us in the northern climate. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the glass here, uh, uh, what you may want to consider for projecting through it. Uh, you have to think about your power and then the security piece. Uh, how comfortable are you leaving it outside? Um, if you are going to leave it outside, are you going to use cable locks to attach it to a tree or use screw and ground anchors? I will tell you this, uh, based on my professional experience and things, no matter how you secure it, they're they're going to find a way to to still steal it. So um, all those kryptonite locks, they're still able to get through them. So no matter what you do, if you're leaving it out there, there always is a potential somebody could still get it. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't consider it. It's it, if there's other things you can do to layering that security cameras and lights that come on at night to, to scare people away. The other thing, if you're going to take it in and out. You'll want to make sure you have that consistent placement to reduce your setup times. So let me talk a little bit about my enclosure. Uh, what I ended up using was a Pelican style case. 
And this was a case I was uh, actually got it clearance at Sam's Club a couple years ago. It was only about 20 bucks. Uh, so I was I just had it sitting around and I thought, oh, this is a perfect use case for it. So it's 18 by 24 by 8. So you want to make sure that you give it plenty of room for that air to circulate around it. Uh, I added three large bud vents with fans. Uh, I had one intake and two uh, exhaust ports to try to get that, that hot air out of there and still bring in the cooler air. I will say that I had to add a third uh, uh, or another fan, a USB fan. I just set it on top of the projector uh, right in the front because the exhaust for my projector um, still was kind of blown to the front of the case and wasn't quite getting out. And it was basically shutting the fan, the projector down. If it overheats, it'll just shut down. Here's where I'll talk about the glass. So when I was on home theater forums, that's where I, I learned about the stuff called port glass or home theater glass, also called white water glass. Uh, basically, it is glass that's intended to allow that light transmission. It reduces the glare and allows more of your image to get through. And so it is a little pricey. I think I paid 30 to $40 for a small piece of it. Uh, and as you see, what I ended up doing was uh, attaching it to the front of my case after I drilled the, the, the hole with a hole saw. I used nano or silicone tape, and that seems to have uh, uh, made it pretty weatherproof. Uh, but that allows that light transmission to go through. And then obviously you can, you'll need your Pi in, in there to control the projector and some type of power inlet, some way to get the power into the case. I used one of these power ports that you can find on Amazon or eBay. And that way I just plug in an extension cord from the outside and then a small power strip on the inside to control the projector and the Pi. So the projector controls, as I mentioned, these aren't, this isn't a necessity. You can manually turn on and off your projector every night. Uh, it's, it's a nice feature to have, but not a necessity. You do need to make sure if you're going to shut your projector off, don't just use a uh, uh, Wi-Fi connected uh, outlet to shut off the projector because they do have a shutdown period where the fan is running to cool it down. If you just put, take the power out of the projector to shut it off, it's going to uh, burn out your bulb much faster, may lead to other issues. So if you haven't ever looked at the projector controls in FPP, you'll want to go to your content setup tab and down, drop down to the plugin manager. You should see the projector control plugin in there. Make sure you download that into your FPP. Once you do that, you can go to the input output setup. And when you get to the input output setup, you'll see it looks very much like this. There's an enable plugin. You'll want to make sure that box is checked. Uh, there's a connection type. So depending on if you have a serial connection, which is what I use with the DB9, the, the RS or R, RS232. Uh, for those that are using the uh, PJ link or IP based controls, it may be a little bit different setup. Uh, again, I'm not as familiar with that. Uh, this is uh, the way I set mine up. Once you do the serial setup, uh, you'll be able to hit the drop down for the projector. It will give you a list of the different projectors. And as you see, that's my projector was on the list. And from there, you're going to see these baud rate, char bits, and stop bits. Uh, if you Google your make and model uh, for the projector that you have, or if you have the manual, uh, what you see here is a screenshot of the back page of my manual that actually gives you this information. So the baud rate was 9,600. Uh, the data bits or char bits was eight. Uh, it tells you that your parity is none, so you can fill in that box, and it gives you your stop bits as well. So that should be what you need. You'll want to save your config, and then you'll be able to go to the next step. Uh, once you do that and you restart FPP, if you go to your scripts tab and look on there, you should see something that looks like this. These are your scripts for your projector. Again, uh, the ones you'll probably use the most are the projector on, projector off. You may need the source ones such as HDMI or digital or video. So the next thing you can do is you can, if you go to your playlist and create or edit a playlist, now's where you can put the projector controls 
into your actual show. Uh, you'll go to the uh, playlist page. Once you get to the type, you'll want to do to the drop down to select the script. And then once you, well, I should back up. This is if you're using your FPV, FPP video device as the master. So the same device that you're using that's connected to the projector is also the master of your show if you have more than one device. You'll select the projector on as your on script. And you may want to go through this again and type a script for pause. Uh, most projectors are going to take a little bit of time for them to warm up and for the, the lights to come on. So I typically did a pause of 60 to 90 seconds as a secondary script on there. And again, as I mentioned, depending on your projector and how it's set up, if it remembers the last settings, you may need to add a video or HDMI or other source to make sure that it's pointed to the right uh, output. Now you'll want to move these probably to your lead in for your playlist. Uh, that is because you only want it to go through this process once. That way, it once it comes on at the beginning of the night, it stays on throughout the course of your show and you leave it that way. However, uh, you can go through the same process and add the projector off script and put that in your lead out at the end of the show. So at the end of your show, after it's all done, the last thing FPP will do is play the projector off script. It will automatically let your projector do the cool down and then it'll just shut off and you should be all set. And it should do that on its own every night at your whatever time in your schedule that you set it. So that's if it was, that was if your device was the master. So in my case, mine was a little more complicated. Uh, as I mentioned, I use a Colt controller. Uh, I used my Colt controller was my master and the Pi was actually my remote. So the video was attached to my Pi, which means I couldn't do the scripts the typical way. So if you are running your video as a remote, this is, you'll need to do a little bit differently. You have to use the FPP command type. Uh, so when you hit that drop down, you'll still get the option to run script that you'll see here. And because you're using uh, multiple devices, you'll want to hit click multicast and then enter the IP address of the remote video device as a host. So this is on your actual, you're using the FPP from your master device, but you're going to be running the script on your remote from your master device. Now, once you do that, you can select your script name, which is projector on or projector off if it's at the end of your night and you should be set to go. And as you can see here, here's my lead in. I've got a run script projector on, a pause script for 90 seconds, and then it plays a basically a, a short intro before my show gets started. Some other FPP settings uh, that uh, you'll probably want to make sure you have on there under your audio video tab. You want to make sure your default device video is out HDMI. Uh, you also probably want to have that blank screen at startup under your system uh, so that it's not projecting all your, your startup information when your projector turns on. So at this point, uh, you could uh, upload a video MP4 file into your Pi uh, at least the one that's connected to the projector. The MP4 file has to have the exact same file name as the sequence, and then it will autoplay. So in my case, whenever my Colt controller, that sequence for that song would come up, or for that sequence, the Pi player would automatically play that video at that same start time. And they should remain in sync throughout that song. You want to make sure, though, that the exact same names are the same. So as you can see here, Merry Christmas.fseq has to be the same as Merry Christmas.mp4 for that to autoplay. Do not use special characters in your file names. As you can see, I had like a dash in one of my uh, file names here. That can cause some problems from, from what other people reported. So make sure you're keeping special characters out of those file names. So once you do all these things, uh, you should be all set to go. You can create a playlist. You can add your sequence and media. Uh, you can see here the script is for projector on. There's a 60 second pause. Uh, you play a video or you play your sequence and the video uploads with it and it should play. And then at the after the end, it should have your projector shut off for you. So that works again, if this is the master, if your video device is a remote, 
you only need the MP4 file saved on the device. You do not have to set it up as a playlist. It will autoplay with the master as long as you have that multi-sync set up. So that is the basics of it, but I do a little bit more, little bonus step here. Uh, so using X lights, um, one of the things I wanted to make sure I was doing is when I was uh, using a sequence and using the video, I wanted to make sure the sequence, the timings matched up with what I was with, with what the video was showing. So what you can do is you can add a null controller into X lights. Uh, as you see here, and you're going to use that to tie your video device to if, if you're not using it as the master. So here I then drew a matrix and put the, uh, the size of the matrix that I wanted in there. I wanted to keep the aspect ratio so it looked correctly. Uh, and then I attached or assigned that to the null controller. So basically this matrix is not going to impact your, your, um, your controller. It's, it's assigned to a null controller. I only use it for sequencing purposes to see what the video will look like to the lights uh, as I'm sequencing. So when you place that video effect on your matrix and you add your videos to the sequence, then you can see all those things together. Uh, so why do I do this? Well, what I'm trying to do is again, uh, match the timing, uh, complementary motions, color themes, um, you may want to add blank portions of your video that your MP4 videos so that you're drawing the viewer's attention to the lighting, not necessarily the video when it's appropriate. Um, and you're thinking, well, that's a lot of trouble to do this. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the cons to using video is it can draw viewers attention away from the lights themselves. So it's really trying to make sure that things are cohesive, that things are, are working together and that it's not distracting to the rest of the show. And a perfect example for this is, uh, I like to use uh, Tom Bet George, his Disney princess uh, sequence. Whether you're a Disney fan or not, if you go and look at this sequence, uh, and just from the still shot, you can see the colors of his video. Now he's using a matrix, not a projector, but the colors he's using when he sequences match the color in, in the video and vice versa. And he uses emotions and he uses all these things together to really make people feel uh, that it's all one one part of one synchronized uh, show. So I think it's it's kind of helpful to see those things together for the for the viewers who are watching these. And here's an example just of a quick one I did for my intro to my show. From all of us to all of you, a Merry Christmas. Okay, Miss Pink, on with the show. Now, I'm sure many of you are much more, much better at sequencing than I am, but this was just a quick way of, of showing how you can make that video and your, your lights to kind of work together instead of compete uh, for those viewers' attention. Uh, if that didn't come through, if the audio didn't come through, you can uh, just click on that YouTube link I put below there. You can you can hear it that way. Uh, the MP4 video file, uh, just if you didn't know, can also be used as your audio file. Uh, it is quite a bit larger probably than your audio file alone, uh, but that is an option. Um, the MP4 file only needs to be on the FPP connect to the projector. Uh, so like I said, in my case, the FPP uh, video part was a remote. And so all I had on it was the video files. Typically after I do the sequencing, I do delete the video from the sequencing that keeps my FACQ files a little bit smaller. And then I avoid that file transfer lag time and timeouts that I was getting. Uh, and then don't forget to load the final FACQ file on your master and remote if it's applicable. So a quick note about video content. Again, I'm not a video expert by any means, uh, but uh, last I was told 1080p is the max res for Pi 4 to handle an FPP, uh, unless that's changed. Uh, I, I had an issue. I tried playing a video that was actually a higher resolution than that um, when I was setting this up and it, it wasn't working and figured out that's that was one of the issues. Um, and really it's not a problem because based where the viewers are, they don't need anything, definitely don't need anything higher than 1080p. 
Uh, and then in terms of video or audio, I use some very basic editing tools. Um, I have full access to the Adobe Creative Suite, but uh, I, it's just so complicated. I don't have time to, to spend the time to learn all those things. So I use some basic YouTube video downloaders, uh, Windows Movie Maker, which I know is is really elementary, but it works for what I use. And then Audacity to, to edit a lot of my audio to tie in together too. So some quick lessons that I learned. Um, I had some issues with lag. Uh, I know the sync packets are supposed to work and it's supposed to uh, work together. And I think what the problem was is because I ran the uh, uh, FPP video as a remote and used my Colt controller as the master. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to be doing this year is, is flipping that around. And that should help with some of it. It wasn't real significant. It would just every now and then seem like a glitch in the in the video playback. Uh, I also experienced some startup glitch. Uh, whenever I took my projector in and out every night, just because I was paranoid and didn't want my projector to come up missing. Uh, and so when you'd set it up and I boot up the uh, the projector or I'd plug it in at the time, it was uh, FPP would play the uh, the script. It would start up the projector, start up my Pi, and then for whatever reason, it it wouldn't. It would just give me a white screen. So then I'd have to reboot the Pi, and as soon as I rebooted the Pi remotely, it worked just fine. So there was a little glitch with that. I never did quite figure what what the issue with that is. But once it was fine, once it was set up, it worked fine. Um, so it was just at the beginning of the night. Wind. Uh, the screen, the the screen that I used, it held up great. It it took a lot of wind, but pretty much any time the winds got over about ten miles per hour, uh, that screen was moving, and it was really distracting to the viewers. So when I ended up moving the screen and attaching it to the front window instead, uh, so that it was stabilized, it couldn't go anywhere. That really helped quite a bit. So what I plan on doing this year is I'm going to try using like a four by eight sheet of Coro and just putting a, uh, a flat gray, light gray paint finish on it to, 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 so it doesn't uh, be too reflective. And then just attaching that to the window frame uh, to use that as my projection surface. And uh, the, one of the great things was when the street light went out. So I'm hoping that somebody takes out my street light this year before my show starts. So it really made a huge difference in, in what you could see. So with that, um, that was just a quick rundown of what I did. Again, I'm not an expert, but I'm willing to answer whatever questions about my setup as, as I can. So I've got a, I've got a comment and a question. Um, yep. First off, what about HDMI control? Um, I know, I, I know the projectors are getting smarter and there's communication over HDMI. I'm not sure there's libraries, maybe third party non stop library for it, but what about that? You know, um, again, I don't have all the answers to that, but uh, I know Pat Delaney is a huge uh, help on that, and he helps manage those uh, scripts. So I would certainly reach out to him, and uh, I was trying to keep it as simple as possible as a new person. That's why I looked at what projectors I knew already worked with FPP, and so that's that's why I used that. Um, but yes, I, I know that there's there are ways to control the projector via web-based interface and some other ways as well. Awesome. And then, um, how did you integrate your video in? Did you, did you just create a 1080p sized no uh, matrix and excellence? Yeah. So, well, that wasn't part of the actual, you could make that part of your sequence, but all I ended up using it for was for sequencing purposes. So that I, when I was making my, as you saw in that intro video, you could see the motion and the effects and how that worked with the video and to get the colors to match. Um, so that's what I used it for. That's why it was just set up to a null controller. I believe the something similar is how you use it for a virtual matrix. So you slap in the video first, but then you plug it and start your sequencing matrix. And, then you slow yep. okay, yep. cool. and then the timing, that way your timing worked all together. I love the seamless, 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 oh my goodness, my team is seamless. Yeah, and, and again, I 
you know, for perfect example, Tom's Tom's sequences, he does a lot of that where all the effects all go with the video. I mean, it, it works, it works great. And I think it, it really helps the viewers kind of tie everything together rather than just some video slapped onto the, uh, the, the show. I'm on the call. This is Pat. I'm on the call. I don't know if you can. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Yeah. I have the right microphone input set up. Ouch. <laughs> so Pat, you could probably answer those, those technical questions on the script stuff. Cause you're the one that helped me. Right. So, um, we wrote, Ben and I wrote the, the projector plug-in probably like five years ago. Uh, so as people have new projectors, if they can't figure them out, they give, uh, they send me or Ben an email and we figure it out and we add it. So there's that, there's not a direct plug-in that does the CEC, the HDMI CEC, but, um, because not all projectors support that protocol, but we, there's other people that have used it. And I, I was looking for the information because it came up earlier today. You can download the, uh, you can do an apt get for that, for the bits that you need. And it's just a script. Now I never got it to work with um, one of my PC monitors that had an HDMI input because it didn't have that, it didn't understand the, the protocol, but I did plug it into a 56 inch um, Samsung monitor and I was able to turn that monitor on and off. <laughs> so you just kind of got to mess around with it. I think maybe what we should do is what, or what I should do is um, slap together a little uh, a how-to document uh, to use that. But there's other people that have used it. Paul T, um, if you go to the Zoom room and if you, if you ever ask about it, They'll, there's plenty of people that know how to set that up. I did it once. I was playing around with it, but I didn't need it because I I have the projector plug in and it works for me because I wrote it. So, well, Ben wrote it and then I tweaked it. So, um, and we have a bunch of projectors. Uh, there's, I think there are like 50 or 60 in there now. Uh, and like I said before, if um, if you know your projector is a Ben Q, but you don't see, and it's a newer one and you don't see the exact model number, just try one of the BenQs uh, because generally all the, you know, the manufacturer keeps the same uh, a protocol for, for each one. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pat. Yep, no worries. Hey, I, I do have just one quick question real quick. Um, if I'm not interrupting, I, I'm, I'm trying to do this amongst chasing my grandkids around and listen. So, you have the master FPP. Do you put the MP4 if you're going to run a remote MPP on the, on that on the MP4 on that one? So you'll want the MP4 on whatever whatever device the projector is connected to. All right. So if I'm running the the projector on a remote, that's where I want to put the MP4. Yeah, that's how I did it. Okay, um, that's what I want to make sure because that. I was wanting to do that last year and I, I ran out of time. Um, that, that's just what I want to make sure that that's what I needed to do. Now, now again, I, I know some people and I know that it does the sync packets and it's supposed to uh, keep it in time. And for the most part it does, but every now and then I'd, I'd have a little glitch. And you'll notice it. it. It'll probably irritate you more than the viewers, but um, right. it does do that occasionally. There are specific use cases too, right? So for Halloween, um, I have a I have a, a, a screen that I put in one of the windows in the front of the house, and I have the projector sitting on the kitchen table, and I have a, a, a standalone pie that's got a, a schedule that says at five o'clock or five, I think it's five thirty. I do the intro. I start the projector up. I wait. It takes twenty five seconds for my projector to come up. I wait that, and then it just runs a loop of uh, the scary skeletons thing that. There's no audio to it. It's just uh, skeletons that are dancing around the house and this and that and the other thing. And it just, it's all completely standalone. So you don't have to do like a, a master remote and because you don't even need your, your Pi master to start that because if all the FPPs are on, a, you know, on your network and they have access to time, it, they start the same, they start the same time. And this is just the loop that runs. Um, there were some issues with, multi-sync and video last year, depending on what version of FPP you were running at the time and when you updated, um, I think we've got that all squared away because I do a lot of the FPP 
multi-sync testing for video. I got, you know, three pies and four, three pies in the back with monitors connected and they just constantly run loops and with the same video and it's all running in sync. So um, I, I think we've got that ironed out, but it, I know that there were a couple of issues depending on the version that you were using last year with, with sync. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I think I stopped updating FPP in October. Um, that sounds about yeah yeah in that area, but yeah, because I didn't want to mess with it before as the show was starting. Check in. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's so always good to upgrade right in the middle. So there's a couple questions um, in the chat. One of which has to do with um, if they get any kind of dew or moisture in the box. Is that an issue or what can they do about that? Uh, I think, I, again, it, I didn't leave mine out, um, but it did, it, it did have, uh, and mine was on a front porch, so it was somewhat protected from the weather. But I think if you have the airflow flowing through it, that, that should help with some of it. Uh, and then again, if it's pretty weather tight, you, you shouldn't get too much moisture in there. But uh, again, I'm not, I'm not in every climate. My climate's different from somebody who lives in Florida and um, it's completely different down there. Um, but maybe somebody else who's on here has, has a different experience. I'm not sure. And somebody asked, do I need a, uh, can I run projection videos through Lightorama on the computer? Mm -hmm. That's again, another one I'm not familiar with. I can speak up to that. I, um, yep. I currently do that. I'm getting away from Lightorama this year, but it's a pretty simple process. And um, when you make your sequence, you just make it a video sequence. And then you plug it right into the side of, well, I use my laptop and I just run the cord right out. And you have to enable that video. And so with, um, in the in the light around my, uh, sequencing software, you, there's one of the tabs, I can't remember which one, but as soon as you hit enable the video, whenever your um, playlist is going, the video will automatically come on. So for whatever song or your sequence you're doing, as soon as the next sequence goes, it plays the next video. So it's really simple to do, um, and and it works out well. Okay. Uh, there was I did have a question myself. Uh, so I'm I project uh, faces on the pumpkins. I make singing pumpkins every year, but I'm interested in adding a second video. Um, so I would essentially be using more than one projector, and would it work um, to be able to do that? As long as I use like, um, as long as I name the media file the same, as, they'd be different videos, but if I name them the same and put them in different, um, different, uh, room, you know, not the master, but the different remote ones, it should essentially work, right? I should be able to play more than one kind of video? Yes. Okay. It's good to know. And do they need to be the same length and time as uh, the sequence? Or, uh, yeah. Uh, only you, you wouldn't want your second one longer than your, your mat, whatever the master one is. Right. So mm -hmm. if, if your, if your master show sequence is one minute and your one of your videos is one minute, but your second video is a minute 10, it's still going to cut off in a minute. Right, you can't go longer than what your original show is, um, be, if you're using multi-sync because it will start the next video. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you. Okay, and right. then I I was thinking it, it came back to me when you were mentioning that you were having issues sometimes the first time it played after powering down. Mm -hmm. There's a setting in Pi Player that when you're configuring it um, to force HDMI on because yeah, what happens that. is if the pie comes up and the projector is not running yet, it doesn't know what resolution to set the, the output of the pie on. So sometimes it will not respond right. So when you reboot, it comes up because your projector is already on. So um, isn't there a delay boot feature in isn't there a way to, I thought there was a delay boot feature or something in FPP. The delay boot is to the, the, the FPPD process coming up, not the OS. The, the, the video problem is it's at the OS level. 
It's the operating mm -hmm. system level. So what you can do is um, you set, um, uh, you know, keep uh, video by default, but you can also set the resolution. There's a drop down where it says default, but you can set the resolution to force it to HDMI. And then you don't have to worry about it. Then if the projector was slow coming up um, or wasn't on before the Pi booted, you should be okay. Hmm. Okay. I'll give that a try. I got a question. Uh, in regards to your uh, pixel, I mean, your configuration setup on the FPP for the resolution, uh, what's the typical, um, what's the average uh, setup on that one? So for, uh, just for like say 1080p, I, I, I don't need to go any higher than that, you know? Like the, is it like 90 by 120? Is it you know, on the on the matrix type of you you mean uh, in a virtual matrix or just it, yeah for a virtual matrix like say oh, projecting onto the projector. Well, if you're talking about for reference for editing, that's one thing. But if you're just if you're building a virtual matrix that you're gonna project out your projector, a lot of folks were just doing instead of. Uh, 1920 by 1080, they were just doing 192 by 108, basically knocking the last zero off. Okay, yeah, 192 by 108, okay. Good to know. And then that that uh, actually, you know, increases the amount of rendering time and everything else. Uh, do you guys do that on virtu on the on the um, X lights or do you guys just do the editing on a, a video and then, and then put it on there to kind of match with the sequence? The way I did it was I just, I kept the MP4 file on the uh, on my in X lights just as long as I was doing the sequencing, and then once I had my sequencing down, I deleted it from it. So that way, gotcha. the file's small. All right. Well, we've got about five minutes before the next session, uh, which is going to be looks like Mr. John Storms. So if there's any other questions, um, we'll take one more question. I got another question. Uh, have you guys used uh, FPP remote with that? Because uh, I've, I've had it, but when I, I found that when you integrate it and then when I do it via uh, X lights and push it over to my Pi, the the quality of the picture and the movie uh, compared to as if you were uploading it directly to like the Pi is totally different. I didn't use FPP remote just because uh, I didn't want to complicate things any more than they already were for me, um, but maybe somebody else did. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate it. Aaron, again, thanks again. Thank you to our sponsors, Boscoyo Studio, um, to uh, RGB Sequences, and to all the vendors, Wally's Lights, Wired Watch, uh, Cloudier Christmas Lights, uh, Lightorama, and all the other vendors. If you get a chance, please check out the sponsor room. The vendors are showcasing any new and innovative products, and uh, there's also um, some discounts going on this weekend. So make sure you check it out. So thank you. All right. Good job, Aaron. That was awesome. <laughs>